I invite you to look with me now at our Old Testament reading for today from the prophet Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 7 through 14. Hear God's word to your life. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company, they shall return there. With weeping, they shall come And with consolations, I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water and in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. And they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil. And over the young of the flock and the herd, their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, we again thank you for the gift of gathering in this sanctuary on this day in this new year, a year certainly filled with promise and hope and newness and a renewed sense of belonging and purpose and meaning. And we know all of these things are possible because you are indeed with us and growing us and leading us and so may we be especially attentive to you through the reading and proclamation of scripture and through all of our worship this day and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you our lord our rock our redeemer amen i've come to realize that the days following christmas and new year's are not my favorite. The spirit that, that filled the Christmas season is gone, or mostly gone. Unless at any point, just days before Christmas, you tried to navigate the Costco or Target parking lots, in which case the spirit of Christmas probably wasn't even there to begin with. But Christmas cards have been received and sent, and gifts exchanged, and decorations have been put away, and Trees have been hauled out to the curb or boxed up, and Christmas music has faded away, thankfully. There's a peculiar sense of sadness or a grieving process I'm sure many, some of you here, go through as we say goodbye to family who have visited or as we look at our bank accounts or even step on the scale. The house looks bleak and sterile. And I shake my head as I try to muster up strength to go back to this normal sense of of living as we meet the year ahead. The effects of overindulgence lingers for some. The loneliness of the holiday season lingers for others. But whatever the case, life has resumed. And the passing holidays leave a variety of emotions in their wake. Because we, in a sense, build something during Christmas, with all of its anticipation and hope and promise and reminders of our value as beloved children of God, and then poof, it vanishes. 
Almost like when a child spend time and effort uh, to build a sandcastle carefully digging and dumping and packing the sand and then all of a sudden the tide rolls in and and wipes the sand castle away and they're left with a mound of wet sand but after a sigh what does the child usually do the child starts digging dumping and packing the wet sand all over again it's a regular occurrence in my household for one child to be building something with Legos or blocks or pillows or something else, and another child comes by with the intent, the sole intent, to destroy. And he does that. But after some tears and screaming, usually, maybe some hitting, the rebuilding begins. That's what we do in our lives. We rebuild We build something beautiful in our minds and in our our lives with our hands. And and we hope that our work endures. And then the tide comes in and rolls over us. That's what we do in our churches and in this church. We build community. We lay a foundation upon which ministry can grow and, and where people can feel like they belong and feel invited to participate. Then the tide comes in and rolls over us. And we're left looking at a formless mound of wet sand sometimes. And yet trial after trial, setback after setback, we rebuild. This church especially knows what that's like. We start digging, dumping, and packing it all over again. It's what we do. And it's also what God does. In 2005, our country experienced a form of destruction, the likes of which, which most of us have never seen before in Hurricane Katrina. I was fortunate to be one of the many the countless volunteers who had the opportunity to serve the people of the Gulf Coast. I mean, remember the horrific and disheartening images we saw on the news? New Orleans alone had become hell on earth as anarchy unfolded and even some police officers became looters and and gangs hijacked the boats of volunteers who had come to rescue them and naked babies wailed for food as men got drunk on stolen liquor. The devastation was beyond comprehension and its effects are even still impacting people today. Many of us at the time were wondering where in the world is God in the midst of all this? And when I was there, a few different trips, though I, it didn't take long for me to notice something special and even holy happening. I saw individuals from all walks of life come together over a common aim. From all different kinds of faith traditions and humanitarian traditions or organizations coming together over a common aim, a common goal to help people rebuild. To restore hope. And if you closed your eyes and listened at the time, the most common sounds you would have heard were the sounds of chainsaws, shovels, and hammers. It wasn't the first or last crisis that this country, or any country for that matter, has seen or will yet see. Still, we rebuild. It's what we do. Because it's what God does. The prophet Jeremiah writes about such a God. These words we just read reveal God's promise to refashion and rebuild the fractured covenant with the people of Israel. In this passage, God leads his people home from exile in Babylon. Jeremiah as a prophet is not necessarily a happy or particularly encouraging prophet. He spends 40 years trying to warn his people about the disaster that's coming. And for 40 years, the only attention he has paid is punishment and hatred. His words were so threatening and frightening that he was considered a traitor and a heretic. And only much later, with several generations worth of hindsight, could the community see that Jeremiah's harsh words had indeed been both prophetic and accurate. Jeremiah, though, ultimately speaks words of God's love, that God's promise will weather the storm. And these words, I believe, help us navigate through the Christmas season, and especially as we 
end Christmas season. This text that we heard a moment ago may well speak to us <coughs> more readily about the famous, more, it may speak to us in better ways than the Christmas stories did on Christmas Eve and Christmas morning. Jeremiah is offering God's people the promise of love, redemption, and renewal. He sees, he sees what is going to happen, defeat and exile. But he also sees that God will not abandon his people. It offers a clean story of a caring God who does not forget who we are or where we are. And in these days following the climax of Christmas, we need to hear these words as we settle on down in the valley where the joy of Christmas has faded because in the days to come, we are once again going to be about rebuilding. Rebuilding our lives. Rebuilding our communities. Rebuilding our hearts, our minds, our souls, our perspectives. And God is right there, right alongside of us. Rebuilding as well. There was a newly appointed pastor who went to visit the home of a congregation member and upon arriving there, the minister discovered his host was an avid gardener and was only too delighted to show his, pa his pastor around the garden the, about the, showing the magnificent sea of, of greens and purples and, and blues and whites and yellows and pinks. Beautiful, beautiful garden. Wanting to set the relationship off on a strong, positive note, the pastor said, praise God for the beauty of his handiwork. But his host, the gardener, replied in a somewhat offended tone, Now, Pastor, don't go giving all the credit to God. He should have seen this garden when God had it to himself. <laughs> the gardener had very good theology. God designed the world in such a way that, that God works in partnership with us and we with God. God rebuilds, and so do we. As the new year dawns, words of renewal and hope fill the air. And with a new beginning comes new possibilities and new energy, maybe new expectations. And there is perhaps no better time than now to hear a forgiving and hopeful word from God. That God plans to rebuild and refashion our individual lives and this community of faith. And when all is said and done, the grace of it all, as we learn from the prophet Jeremiah, is that we will be closer to God than we were before. In the Western Church, we indeed call this Sunday simply the second Sunday after Christmas. But Wednesday of this week, January 6th, will be Epiphany, the official end of Christmas. And only a small percentage of Christians will take note since they ceased being Christmassy the day after Christmas, even though the church celebrates the 12 days of Christmas called Christmas Tide. But in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, Epiphany is Christmas. Epiphany is the day when the wise men arrived where Joseph and Mary were staying and worshiped the newborn Jesus. And in our Cliff's Notes versions of Christmas, in the West, we converge all of the miracles of Emmanuel, God with us, into one magical night. But the wise men, who were Persian astrologers, Gentile wizards, outside-of-the-box scholars of their day, were still following that strange star during this time. They were making their way to Bethlehem to find whatever awaited them at the end of their star quest. And what awaited them is what still awaits us, of which Jeremiah spoke. Words from God that go something like this. I have loved you with an everlasting love. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for their sorrow. Friends, the world is overwhelming at times, maybe oftentimes. We know that. Changes are swift and drastic. Christmas is pretty much over. 
and we're left thinking, what's next? Life is back to business as usual, and therefore for some meaning and purpose may seem quite uncertain. Yet we are not alone. God is greater. God is here. God is leading us. God rebuilds. And so do we. We know that God didn't stop at Christmas. He made his home with us and he is rebuilding us even at this very moment. So why shouldn't we believe that our future with God may very well be even stronger, even better than our past? Amen.